Uh, good afternoon and welcome to the, the Wilson Center. My name is Roger Mark D'Souza and I direct our programs on global sustainability and resilience here at, at the Woodrow Wilson Center. And I'm really pleased that we can have, uh, I think, a very timely discussion on insights on ending famines, creating food security, and fostering thriving livelihoods in a changing world. A really um, important and critical set of issues issues around food security, resilience, livelihoods in the face of, of a number of changes. And we're particularly pleased that we're able to um, convene today's discussion with our partners at Tetra Tech, uh, one of our long-standing uh, partners whom we've been doing some very good and interesting programming with, with the Center for International Earth Science Information Network season at the Earth Institute at Columbia University, and our colleagues from the Friedman School of Nutrition, Science and policy at uh, Tufts University. Um, I know many of you are familiar with the Woodrow Wilson Center. We serve as a living memorial to President Wilson, and we focus on how we can bring evidence and analysis um, to meaningful and practical discussions related to policies and programs. And just today, by the University of Pennsylvania Global Think Tank Index, we were once again recognized as the number one think tank in the world for transdisciplinary research. And we're very pleased at, at getting recognized for our work across disciplines because I think the topic that we will be discussing uh, today very much fits um, in that context. And I'm pleased that we have um, an excellent panel to discuss um, these topics with us today. We want to really look at what, what are we learning um, I hope through our discussion we will have um, some back and forth on what we are not learning and why. I hope that we talk about ways that we can foster resilience um, at different scales and, and how that is linked to livelihoods in the context of, of food security. So we're aiming for a fairly informal conversation uh, this afternoon. Um, once again, this is being webcast live, so we may have questions that come to us online and we'll take those questions um, as they come also. So I'm gonna ask each of the panelists one question as a way to kick off kick off the conversation. And I'm gonna start with a, a longtime friend and colleague, we've known each other for quite a while, Alexis Sherbiden is the Associate Director for Science Applications of Columbia University's Center for International Earth Science Information Network. Many of us are very familiar with CSUN. He's also the Deputy Manager of the NASA Socioeconomic Data and Applications Center, SIDAC. So Alex, um, over the years, has really developed um, spe specialization and expertise in the human aspects of global environmental change, climate vulnerability mapping, climate change migration, urban climate vulnerability and resilience, environmental indicators, and examining ways to integrate remote sensing and socioeconomic data in a variety of, of scales and application areas. So Alex, you, you look at these questions very much from the perspective of a scientist. You're looking at how we deal with questions in the social, natural, and information realms, and you're looking at the degree to which climate science is useful in helping us to think about social problems. What have you been learning? What have you learned? And how are we making progress in being able to analyze climate risks for those who are most vulnerable? What, what are your thoughts? Well, thank you very much, Roger Mark, and it's a real pleasure to be here. I think this is my third occasion to, to speak here at uh, the ECSP, uh, Environmental Change and Security Project at Woodrow Wilson Center. Um, I, uh, I feel a little bit like an imposter. I'm a geographer that cover, and as you can tell, can tell from my biography, uh, I cover a lot of different issue areas. and. Uh, I think the unifying element is that I think spatially and uh, I, I work a lot with data and analytics to try to come to answers and, and you know, confirm hypotheses and test uh, whether we're on the right track or not with our, our programs. Um, so, you know, I want to also just say that I, I am also representing colleagues at uh, the International Research Institute for Climate and Society. In many ways, they're far more expert than I am on issues of food security. 
and they're also uh, very much at the forefront of data analysis. And so some of the comments I make today are going to be drawing on some helpful uh, suggestions by colleagues there, uh, Jim Hansen, uh, Dan Osgood, and Alessandro Giannini, among others. Um, so what I would want to say in sort of at the high level is that we now have more data and tools than ever before and that they can serve three main purposes. One is to understand the underlying drivers of food insecurity. The other is to, to sort of trigger early warning systems and address crises before they emerge. And the third is to develop strategies to improve long-term food security. Um, so I'll, I'll address those a little bit more in a moment, but um, I guess countervailing that, so that's sort of the optimistic, the glass is half full side of the story. The other glass is half full, um, half empty side of the story is that, of course, climate change and var variability and um, governance crises in many parts of the world are leading to food insecurity crises on a scale that we've rarely seen. And so maybe we can come back to that and discuss that a little bit more, and I'm sure other colleagues on the panel will have more to say about that. Um, so talking about these three elements in, in terms of data and analytics, um, the first understanding drivers of inf uh, food insecurity, I would say, is really kind of looking at and learning from the past. The second, uh, how to intervene and to prevent crises before they emerge is really this, the present. How can we address matters in the present? And the third, developing strategies to improve long-term food security uh, in the future is the future. So let's look at those in turn. Um, in terms of understanding drivers of food uh, insecurity, uh, a lot has been done recently to really um, plumb and mine the incredible wealth of various uh, data sources uh, at household level, and I think Ellen will be addressing m some more of that, those kinds of findings. But um, you look at the Living Standard Measurement Survey, the Demographic and Health Surveys, the Multiple Indicator Cluster Surveys, and the uh, WFP's uh, Climate um, and Food Security Vulnerability Analyses, and these, um, s these data sources really provide tremendous wealth in terms of helping us to better target interventions and uh, kind of uh, hone our ability to, to um, you know, address the food security of households. So factors such as, you know, are you well-educated or not well-educated? Are you a female-headed household? What kind of assets do you have? Um, do you have access to village-level saving uh, associations? Do you, um, um, you know, are you a member of a, uh, s a church group or another sort of civil so society organization or, or local group that might enable you to have higher social capital? All those things uh, very much play out at local levels and can help us to target um, programs like Feed the Future uh, or, you know, um, local um, social protection programs in different countries. A good example is one I learned about yesterday, uh, a colleague Brent McCusker who works with the AID uh, USAID Geo Center. has been doing a lot of work in different countries, uh, Rwanda, Ethiopia, um, Bangladesh, uh, Malawi. And one, the example he gave in Ethiopia was one of using geographic weighted regression and various spatial analysis techniques to really actually determine um, which factors at the household level are most likely to be predictive of reporting food shocks and uh, exposure to uh, bad exposures to natural hazards. Uh, and they've been using those in, uh, data and information in Ethiopia very much to target interventions from Feed the Future as well as other programs. Um, on the climate data side, we have the ability to understand now at, uh, you know, um, and analyze what are some of the kind of climatic precursors to major food insecurity events. So it's not just whether the average rainfall over a rainy season that matters, it's whether the monsoon may have been delayed or not, whether uh, there have been gaps in the rainy season, or if the temperature uh, exceeded certain thresholds during the flowering or reproductive cycle. Um, those kinds of things can have fairly dramatic impacts on crop yields. And so understanding those as uh, impacts, direct impacts on crops, as well as how climate shocks can affect the overall food system, access to markets, and things of that sort, um, are 
uh, helping us to learn from the past and to better uh, plan for the future. Uh, the second area, as I mentioned, was intervening to uh, prevent present crises, and there uh, some of the work that IRI and other groups are doing to develop seasonal and sub-seasonal scale forecasts um, that can trigger early warning systems based on the, uh, um, uh, you know, the various triggers that are exist. Um, those are really vitally important, and we know that if you can intervene early enough in a food security crisis, um, you can save lots of costs. Uh, there's both the cost to the people involved. If you get there too late and uh, people really, uh, s children especially, start suffering famine and, and uh, stunting, well, that affects their long-term ability, uh, cognitive ability and other things uh, it, it, uh, you know, and their future potential. Uh, so that's a, that's a tragedy that could be avoided. Uh, but also there's costs that, um, uh, in terms of pre-positioning aid supplies, um, getting food there uh, early enough, providing uh, food and uh, cash vouchers that would allow people to purchase the food they need um, locally uh, if it's available or, or to get food um, shipped in at lowest cost possible rather than, say, airlifting food and tents and things of that sort. Um, that's kind of on the climate side. On the, on the more social side, you have uh, now the ability through um, the widespread use of internet, but also cell phones, which uh, are more widely used than uh, and more widely accessible to households in many developing countries than adequate food and water. Uh, you know, the, 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 the change has been dramatic in a very short time period. Um, so there's a number of ways that we can use these uh, cell phones to, to better understand what's going on on the ground. One is through the call detail records, which allow um, uh, real-time sort of uh, uh, analysis of where people are relative where to where they normally uh, are. So in other words, you can look at the long-term patterns of my mobility in a country and then compare those to uh, the, what's going on at a current time and, and look at the different, the, um, any discrepancies or, or deviations from the norm. The other is in charge, recharge rates. Um, so, you know, many of us who've traveled in developing countries know that your driver will often stop all of a sudden and on the side of the road and uh, they've got to recharge their phone because they just got paid by somebody and so they take what little money they have and they recharge their phone a certain number of minutes. Um, well, this just turns out to be a pretty sensitive marker. Uh, if you stop recharging your phone, that means you've got something way more important like food um, to take care of. And so uh, those can be uh, triggers if suddenly the amount of minutes that people are uh, recharging goes down. Um, that could be a sensitive marker as to whether there's a potential food security crisis uh, developing. But then you have things like SS SMS messages and the World Food Program's mobile vulner uh, vulnerability analysis and monitoring the WVAM, which basically you know, allows people to directly text and say, we're in crisis. You know, it's modeled a bit on things like Ushahidi, where, uh, which was used during the election crisis in Uganda and, or Kenya and has since been used widely to report, you know, self-report disaster issues and, and locate people in real time and real space. Um, so those are very important for the present. Turning now to the third and last area, which is developing strategies to improve long-term food security for the future. Um, the, I mean, overall, what um, we've been very in engaged at season in, in um, a lot of the discussions around the 2030 agenda and setting up monitoring and information systems that allow us to better track uh, the um, the achievement of those goals or the non-achievement. And so I would say that one, uh, you know, goal two, as most of you are aware, is to end hunger through improved nutrition and sustainable agriculture. So I would say that one very important thing is for the food security community and humanitarian community to latch on to this new global impetus on the part of not only UN agencies, but groups like Group on Earth Observation and others to, um, to help um, uh, kind of set up those data systems. Um, uh, we're also involved with NASA and USAID's Servier at season, and Servier has, you know, been shown they're using space technologies in very important ways to, pr to, to predict floods um, and to um, help uh, avert food security issues in many countries.
The other area that we were engaged in is uh, uh, some vulnerability mapping. So this is a combination of socioeconomic data and climate data in ways that enable us to understand the spatial patterns of household, uh, well, really regional vulnerability. We, we cannot always drill down to the household level. We're taking averages, basically, of DHS and other data over space to understand um, where people are most likely to be vulnerable in the future to climate shocks. And uh, that work in Mali that we did uh, under the Africa Resilience uh, Climate Change Program, ARC, uh, was used to actually target the Climate Change Adaptation Program that USAID is funding in Mali. So uh, the one of the important aspects is, is if you do include, and you should really include, um, climate model outputs in these, you can begin to understand where certain regions may be approaching the limits of uh, their adaptive capacity or ability to produce food in the future. Um, I want to say as an aside that under uh, the Soci Socio-Environmental uh, Synthesis Center, which is at, uh, in Baltimore as part of the University of Maryland, I have a research project with a number of colleagues looking at how we can better improve and what methodologies can be used to do better job of vulnerability and mapping because that is a way uh, to better target our assistance in the future. Um, you know, turning back to this issue, whether there will be areas in the world where, in fact, you simply cannot, you know, uh, is the margin of the Sahel going to become essentially an area where uh, even the, the, more the coarse grains like millet and sorghum are no longer producible because you've either reached temperature limits or, uh, uh, you know, rainfall variability limits. I think we need to look at some of those issues very seriously and under World Bank funding we're doing some work that will look at whether migration may be one of the few outcomes that really, uh, you know, you, we tend to think of migration as the failure of adaptation but it actually may improve resilience for many communities if they simply are in regions that are no longer going to be sustainable from an agricultural perspective. So I think I'll leave my comments there and I look forward to hearing the comments from other members of the panel. Thank you. Thanks very much, Alex. <laughs> so you've, you've covered a lot of ground. I just uh, wanted to probe a little bit more. In particular, you talked about, uh, for example, the vulnerability mapping. Is, is there something that you have learned recently about all of this, this research and, and work that you're doing and practical application on the, gr on the ground. Is there something that you have learned recently that surprised you? Say, gosh, I didn't know that. That's really good. What's, what's, what's good and new and surprising for you of late in this work that you're doing? Um, I think that th this, this work on vulnerability mapping is still very much work in progress in many places, but um, Part of what we're doing under the CESINC project is to look at uh, the, um, the breadth of what's being done in this area under the banner of vulnerability and risk mapping to see what best practices might be developed. So I did, you know, I don't want to be a boring academic and say I read a really good journal article recently, <laughs> but I did. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, it was uh, actually done by the group in, um, uh, in Amsterdam, um, the, the, the food uh, security group that, that uh, where they really mined, I think, the DHS data in really novel and interesting ways to better uh, understand, um, again, you know, what, what are the, the household level drivers that are causing people to uh, end up in, pr in situations where food security is an issue. And a lot of this, and I think Alan will corroborate what I'm about to say, is very locally driven and contextual, and so you do need to, to drill down. And, one of the things that we learned from our mapping was that, um, you know, we can map where there's likely to be future vulnerability, but we can't necessarily tell you what to do to actually address those issues. Mm -hmm. And so I think that is where the, the, the big gains are to be made in, in vulnerability mapping is to be able to actually identify interventions. Yeah, thank you. So, Ellen, you, you're nodding your head in agreement about you know, the, the local focus. So Ellen Mathis has uh, more than 20 years of experience conducting international food security livelihoods and early warning analyses and program support. Most recently in the past 12 years, she's been providing technical assistance to USAID headquarters here in Washington, to USAID missions, and USAID funded implementing uh, partners, both internationally and at the national level. 
Uh, Ellen has done a lot of work in Uganda, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Mali, Madagascar, Niger, Burkina Faso, and, and other places. So Ellen, you, you have a lot of experience um, with USAID, and as you know, USAID is, is working to fund multi-year food security projects in areas that are, are chronically prone to shocks. And, and working towards looking at sustainable ways to strengthen food security and, and resilience. And I wonder whether you could share from your perspective, what are some of the strategies, activities, and tools for community level, community level food security and resilience strengthening that you think is exciting for us uh, now? Sure. Um, thank you, Raja Mark, and um, thank you, Alex. Um, I think it's fascinating to look at how the um, agencies that are working essentially on the front lines of community resilience strengthening are adapting their projects because they're, um, they're actually demonstrating a high degree of innovation, in my view, um, in terms of how to integrate a resilience approach in their programming within the constraints of funding. And in fact, um, they're benefiting from some policy uh, adaptations, no pun intended, um, to reflect the need to look at resilience as well. And so I, I just wanted to highlight some areas in which um, we're, we're seeing a lot of innovation uh, in at field level. Um, the USAID Food for Peace um, funds programs in very uh, shock-prone, um, highly food insecure um, communities, countries and communities. And um, I've had the privilege of I'm helping to draw lessons learned about those programs for the past eight or 10 years or so. And um, I th as a general observation, um, we have seen that um, climate change, or cl increasing climate variability, tends to impact these communities where we, are, we have a, f a big footprint um, through two main mechanisms. One is increasing um, rainfall variability and causing production shocks. And the other is increasing um, price variability, essentially causing market and food access shocks. And so um, the development of food security activities are as you, as they've been rec until recently called DFAPs, um, Development Food Assistance Programs. Um, so now we have the much more cumbersome title of Development Food Security Activities. I'm missing the DFAP acronym. Um, are adapting to this um, reality and trying to strengthen um, communities' capacity to bounce back or bounce back better given these, not only, um, we used to think of them as external shocks, but in fact they're very intrinsic, often chronic stressors as well. It is the nature of the environment that they're um, continually under stress. Um, and we're getting a increased data, as Alex discussed, about the nature of those stresses. So, um, USAID Food for Peace requested the FANTA project to uh, analyze the food security situation in many of these countries where a, a development food assistance assistance project is ending and another is starting. And they've added an element in the last few years of drawing lessons learned about the programs. And it is from that experience that I speak today. Um, so essentially food for peace development food security activities have been on the front lines innovating in resilience in some of the most vulnerable countries and communities in the world and some of the high um, most promising or new and emerging adaptations that they're making to their projects are as follows um, the first category is innovations in management approaches and that's from the donor side as well as internally within the awardees practices um, I would highlight USAID food for peace's refine and implement approach um, which um, essentially gives the awardees space to take the first year and conduct formative and operations research and refine the program, refine the theory of change, et cetera, so they can have a more nuanced um, an analysis of the vulnerability, um, the vulnerability patterns within that community. Um, and also the mechanism of having crisis modifiers has allowed uh, essentially development, food assisted development programs to receive a rapid injection of funds to um, uh, respond to an emergency in that area. Um, so it's a contractual mechanism that um, facilitates um, rapid response so that um, an idiosyncratic, uh, not an idiosyncratic, a covariate shock, a sudden shock that affects that community doesn't essentially rob the population of the development gains that are being made because of that program. 
So that's tremendous. Um, we're seeing increasingly um, flexible management approaches used by awardees. Um, that involves uh, ongoing operations research. Um, right now, we're looking at programs in Niger and Burkina Faso. They have you know, maybe three ops research projects going on at any given time uh, with full support of USAID. So it is very interesting, gender studies, um, looking more closely at labor markets, um, the effects of um, you know, uh, constraints to access to certain types of input markets or output markets. Um, all of these things, there's a lot of room for um, research along the way. Um, there's a uh, uh, return to using a theory of change model to underpin uh, program design and monitoring and evaluation. Um, there's a shift of focus from um, food security to resilience, but increasingly also a shift to resilient systems rather than just resilient communities and resilient households. It's, r it's system strengthening for sustainability. Um, what we're really seeing so much now, and it's, I think it's an area of tremendous promise, is multi-layered and integrated programming with Food for Peace, OFDA, Feed the Future, Global Health Initiative, Democracy and Governance, Education, et cetera, such as one sees in Somalia, where UN and Food for Peace and OFDA pr and um, some value chain programs are co-located, as well as in Ethiopia and in um, Burkina Faso and Niger under the RISE Initiative, um, where we have Regis AG, um, Regis ER and the DFAPs co-located, and it's it's uh, and it's utterly um, catalyzing uh, the impact of um, the the investments that are being made through the Title II pr program because there are um, there's much more market um, strengthening. Uh, intervention going on so that when you're trying to connect vulnerable households to markets, you're working with multiple layers of actors in the input markets, in uh, value chain, added, you know, added value processing, and all the and storage and marketing and all of these layers of uh, marketing systems. So um, I think that's a huge um, area of growth within USAID's uh, food security work. Um, um, agencies are working on land, water, and natural resource management efforts, especially with women and pastoralists. What we're finding is even when communities will allocate land to women, they don't have long-term tenure. And when you're working, such as in Karamoja, with pastoralist communities, the management of communal resources is tremendously complicated, and we're needing to engage on uh, land tenure, water resource tenure, grazing land tenure, you know, all of these tricky issues, and it, it very much um, brings in issues of gender as well. So, um, and then finally, with regard to natural resource management, um, farmer-managed natural um, regeneration, conservation agriculture, and bioreclamation of degraded land, which has helped to re-green um, vast areas of land in the Sahel. Um, we are... It, it, better integrating the concept of resilience um, through um, strengthening the emphasis on diversification of livelihoods. So rather than just an emphasis on increasing income through one economic activity for farmers, you know, it's recognizing that uh, you uh, may not optimize income, but you will optimize resilience in the face of shocks if households are able to draw on, for example, farming with food crops and cash crops and then off-farm income-generating activities as well. And so it, it requires sort of a broader technical footprint of the NGO, but it's... Um, it's a better adaptive strategy in the face of shocks. Um, a larger emphasis on microfinance, it's fascinating. We're seeing microfinance being integrated into MCHN care group models. You know, microfinance is being integrated into almost everything now um, because um, lack of access to finance is such a critical constraint um, when we look at the obstacles to resilient food security at community level. So, um, And it's not only uh, creating microfinance products, it's creating appropriate products for specific groups at multiple levels you know, sort of three or more levels, going from community up to um, district working at national microfinance institutions. So it's, it's become much more refined in the last few years. Um, the, adapt the inclusion of graduation programming for chronically poor and very poor uh, households. And then finally, um, the um, programming of climate smart income generating activities such as improved stoves, renewable energy, briquettes for fuel, and fabrication of in improved granaries. 
um, we're seeing the, a lot of research, especially with um, regional and national uh, res ag, ag research institutions, looking at climate smart um, ag and livestock strategies, and to some extent um, aquaculture and apiculture as well. But um, looking at, again, returning to drought resistant local seed varieties. They may be improved, but they're, um, they're grains that the local communities know and that they can produce. Um, because it's very difficult in the era of increased climate variability sometimes to get seedlings to rural areas for planting to demonstration plots or whatever. So um, farmers are more likely to use a, a local grain that is tested. You know, they do the local level research and find out which are most um, drought resistant and disease resistant within the environment. Um, so it's very much evidence based, but they're um, returning more to locally adapted crops and also livestock breeds. Um, a lot of times the, uh, the local livestock breeds um, are better adapted to drought and, and in fact have much lower mortality rates than the improved breeds that agencies sometimes like to bring in. Um, and finally, providing um, technical support, ag, ag technical support via SMS-based technologies, um, which the uh, HNI, I think it is, has done a lot of work on that. So, um, and then, oh my gosh, it's huge, uh, market-level interventions using a value chain approach. Um, I mentioned the, the multi-layering of um, programming resources from different branches of um, USAID and US government um, and, and linking up with the UN, et cetera. Um, we're doing a lot more work in strengthening access to market information systems by smallholders, um, cash and voucher programming to ensure access to seeds and other inputs, um, working with livestock traders to manage destocking ahead of a drought, uh, working with grain traders to connect with local producers um, to boost local availability. Increased use of risk financing, which we may discuss later, um, such as weather index insurance or weather forecast insurance, uh, as they do in Niger and Kenya, and local, regional, local and regional purchase. And then finally, um, we're working, do, the agencies are doing a lot more work with strengthening government and community capacity for early warning, climate change mitigation, and disaster preparedness. And to be frank, this is a major area for growth. It's extremely difficult to do local um, early warning systems and response. There, um, there is very low capacity to manage those data. Um, there are some projects now that uh, transmit the data digitally, you know, by phone. Um, and but but um, setting up an entire multi-level system where those er local early warning data are funded to link to local adaptations, either with covariate shocks such as a drought, or with even um, idiosyncratic shocks such as uh, the loss of a household member to disease or something like that. Um, it's I think a lot of agencies are trying to do this work, but it's an area where we really need to do a better job documenting best practices. Um, some of the key challenges I wanted to highlight very quickly, uh, um, the need to scale up monitoring at community level, particularly with nutrition surveillance. Um, differences in vulnerability by gender, age, and livelihood group. Uh, USAID is putting a greater emphasis on uh, gender and youth. Um, and now for upcoming food security, development food security ac activities, they need to um, identify a gender and youth advisor, which is a step forward. Um, governance issues. I mentioned the issue of land tenure and working in conflict areas and areas with fragile governance. Tremendous, tremendous challenge for early warning. Um, the level of granularity. A lot of times our early warning data are available at district level and above, and they really need more localized, you know, dist district and below data for effective response. Um, identifying the leverage points for intervention. Again, the vulnerability patterns differ by age and gender and livelihood uh, pattern. And so we don't have a lot of evidence um, on kind of good practices for identifying leverage points for when you intervene and how. And, um, and ensuring gender equity and women's empowerment. Um, I mentioned the issue of transmitting early warning data. And then finally, this issue of backsliding into poverty. You know, we do good resilience work, but then you see more backsliding because, usually because of idiosyncratic shocks. You know, the loss of a household member to disease is, is, a, is a common one. And um, we need to uh, continue to strengthen our research into how do you sustainably facilitate graduation out of poverty to resilient livelihoods, given what's coming out of the scientific community about um, you know 
about rainfall projections, uh, soil mo moisture and effects on projected production. So um, we're, I'm glad that there's such a, a good um, interaction with the scientific community and the community of practice and early warning and response. So those are kind of the major areas in which I think the agencies are innovating. There is a lot of research coming out, um, especially of the broader, well, Ethiopia, RISE, Burkina, and um, Niger is doing a lot of um, research that's coming out right now. So it's, I think you're, um, Uganda, a lot of great work in Uganda. So we'll sort of keep it in the public sphere. Great. Thank you very much, Ellen. <laughs> Um, I, I was interested to hear the focus and sort of reframing around resilience. You know that there's so many criticisms of the, of the resilience approach. Um, how do you deal with power dynamics? How do you deal with gender issues? Resilience of what to what? What are the indicators? How do you measure and engage? So I think in, you, you talked about a lot of those. So I was glad to sort of hear you in your comments sort of respond to the question that was formulating in my mind. So thank you very much. Um, so, so Dan, Ellen has has talked about a lot of the challenges that remain. And um, so Dan Maxwell is the Henry J. Lear Professor in Food Security and the Acting Director of the Feinstein International Center at Tufts Friedman School of Nutrition, Science, and Policy. He leads programs on food security and livelihoods in complex emergencies, and previously served as the chair of the Department of Food and Nutrition Policy at the school. He um, has a, a, a long experience working with a variety of actors, governments, humanitarian agencies and affected communities at the grassroots national and regional levels. Um, so Dan, you've heard a little bit from Ellen and Alex uh, discussing vulnerability analysis and, and um, the use of evidence. And I, I, I believe that one of the things that you have been focusing on is the response to the Somali famine in, in 2011. And, and we would think that we have learned um, from that experience, what, what, what have we learned from looking at, at the um, Somali famine? Uh, how are we putting that information to use? And um, what are some of the opportunities right now? Uh, thank you, Roger Mark, and thank you for um, uh, convening this important meeting this afternoon. The, the uh, most serious incident of actual famine in the past 15 years took place in Somalia in 2011. And one of the unique things about it was that for the first time really in history, we had both uh, a consensus definition of what constitutes uh, a famine and the ability to analyze uh, in real time the, the data that would tell us whether or not famine was occurring. This all takes place under something called the Integrated Food Security uh, Phase Classification or IPC tool. That, that famine resulted as a result of the confluence of a number of, of factors. Uh, there was a major drought in the Horn of Africa um, that resulted in a, in a major production shock uh, and a labor market shock for people who relied on, on agricultural labor. Um, there was a coincidental global spike in the price of food that really was not related to the, to the drought, uh, to the local drought, um, but uh, increased the price of food dramatically at a, at a, um, at a time when um, production was already low, and Somalia, of course, is a, is a food importing country even in the best of years. Uh, there was an ongoing conflict or, or a sort of a, a, a political shock. And finally, there was a number of factors that uh, limited humanitarian action in response to the information about the famine, or, or what we would call in my business a response failure. The crisis was well predicted. We knew we knew it was coming, uh, but for a number of reasons, the, a response that was proportional to the magnitude of the crisis was not really mounted until after the famine was declared. The epicenter of that uh, affected area was controlled by al-Shabaab, who were a, a jihadist group that was labeled by the United States and a number of other uh, Western countries as a foreign terrorist organization. Their policies were responsible for undermining uh, local social safety nets in the part of the country that they controlled, and also for, for expelling or extremely uh, uh, constraining the activities of humanitarian agencies in the area. But Western donor policies also criminalized the leakage or diversion of aid that ended up in the hands of terrorist groups. And it was this combination of, um, of security and access constraints 
as, a, as a result of al-Shabaab with the sort of legal and reputational risks associated with aid diversion that was imposed by donors that resulted in, first of all, key humanitarian actors not being there at all. The World Food Program was not, was not in the area. Neither was CARE. Those were the two major food uh, actors that had been operating in the area. And substantially complicated and delayed any, any uh, proportional response by the international humanitarian community until after the famine uh, was declared. Um, various legal workarounds, such as in the U.S. case, uh, a NOFAC license uh, granted to U.S. agencies, were eventually worked out, but they were delayed until after the famine was declared. So as a result, we saw again in Somalia in 2011 uh, this recurring phenomenon of early warning and late response, or knowing what's, what's coming down the pike at us, knowing that a crisis is happening, but not responding until really the, the, the opportunities for mitigating the damage to livelihoods, for preventing uh, distress migration, and for preventing malnutrition and indeed uh, death, that until those chances had already slipped away. After the famine was declared, um, the, the uh, size of the consolidated appeal, the UN consolidated appeal, doubled, and the proportion of that appeal that was funded went from being about half funded uh, at a smaller level before the famine to nearly 80 percent funded at uh, a, a double level after the famine. So in other words, about a threefold increase in, in, in the amount of funding and the amount of attention being given to this crisis. Funding doubled overnight in July of 2011 and eventually about tripled. This was sort of the harbinger of um, other crises that have taken place in the second decade of the 21st century. Um, we have since seen famines or very near famines, and I'll talk about that in just a second, in, in Nigeria, in South Sudan, uh, potentially in, in Yemen, potentially again this year in Somalia, in Iraq, in Syria, and various places. And in all of these places, um, there is a variety of causes that drive these things, but one of the, one of the recurrent themes is uh, conflict in which one of the parties, or one or more of the parties, um, is an armed non-state actor, including designated terrorists. This is where the risk of famine exists uh, in the 21st century. Um, since Somalia, uh, IPC analysis has put famine declarations on the table at least twice and, and with, with two more potential cases uh, this year. The two actual cases have been in South Sudan uh, for the past several years and uh, most recently in northeastern Nigeria and is anticipated in uh, at least two additional contexts uh, this year in, in, in Yemen and uh, perhaps again in Somalia. In the analyses in, in South Sudan, which we have now done um, six times since conflict reemerged there in 2013, um, and in Nigeria late last year, it was very difficult to make a clear determination about whether famine was or was not occurring. It turns out that Somalia in 2011 was sort of an anomaly. Number one, despite access constraints, uh, there was actually very good information on which uh, a, 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 an analysis and a declaration could be made. Um, there was relatively little state oversight of that analysis process. The state, such as it was in Somalia in 2011, had other fish to fry. Um, so the analysis was relatively independent, as was the declaration. And finally, uh, as several people have mentioned already this afternoon, Somalia had a good functioning cell phone network. It has a nationwide network of, of uh, money transfer companies, or, or hawalas as they're known uh, locally. And uh, despite conflict, uh, it has reasonably functioning markets. All of these things speeded up the eventual response, which was in the form of uh, mostly cash transfers, not, not, um, not food aid. South Sudan proved to be very different. Um, the analysis and declaration of famine or phase classifications of a, of, a, of a lower degree of severity has been severely hampered by poor quality data or missing data. Uh, data on mortality in particular has been uh, missing from nearly every analysis that we've conducted since uh, 2013. And when I say uh, we, I mean the uh, Emergency Review Committee, which is activated by the, um, the, the people that do the IPC analysis in the event that a Phase 5 or famine uh, declaration or famine uh, determination is, is, is on the table for the analysis. So with this dis missing data, it's basically been impossible to, to declare whether a famine <coughs> has occurred or to declare definitively that a famine uh, has not occurred. Now, the reasons that information was missing, um, and hence 
unambiguous analysis and declaration was, was difficult to impossible was not always clear, but it does seem clear that politics played some role in this. It wasn't merely a question of access and security. Um, it was fairly clear that the South Sudanese state did not want discussions of a famine to be on the table and that that had something to do with why some of the data wasn't on the table. Any kind of political um, uh, interference has been subtle, uh, but the outcome has been that over three years in a particularly complex emergency, the status of famine, and whether or not it has occurred, um, was never d definitively uh, determined. No famine was declared, but uh, households were declared to be in phase five or in famine-like conditions, and we have seen rather liberal use of something called phase four with an exclamation mark, which means actually things would be famine were it not for the humanitarian, um, the ongoing humanitarian intervention. And in terms of the, uh, uh, in terms of the international response, there was a fairly robust response to South Sudan in 2014, immediately after the outbreak of this renewed uh, nationwide conflict. But it has sort of spluttered along as a forgotten crisis in 2015 and 2016, with less than half of the cap appeal um, of funding. And again, in, in, in 2017, we are facing the same, the same situation. In Nigeria, access for either analytical or, or response uh, purposes was almost non-existent in Boko Haram-controlled territories for most of, uh, most of a year. And when access to the uh, worst affected areas became possible in mid-2016, time was very constrained and information was of only limited quality and only um, uh, of limited availability. The information indicated a, a very severe humanitarian emergency in formerly Boko Haram controlled territory, but once again the quality of the data was insufficient to make uh, an unambiguous determination about famine status. Famine was declared likely to have occurred uh, in those areas and potentially continuing in inaccessible areas um, up to the present. So what does all this uh, mean for us? First of all, I would like to note that just uh, today or, or last night, uh, FuseNet put out uh, a report on the current status uh, relating to food assistance needs for 2017, and they've noted that this is, the, this is likely to be the worst year in recent history, with something like 70 million people globally uh, needing food assistance. That's a figure that's up almost 50 percent uh, in the last couple of years. And this is on top of, this wasn't in the FuseNet report, but this is on top of an already yawning gap in humanitarian response to crises worldwide, not just in terms of food assistance, but in terms of, in terms of uh, humanitarian needs worldwide. Last year, the gap between assessed need and uh, funded programs was nearly 50 percent uh, globally. In other words, we got half as much money uh, to respond to, to um, humanitarian emergencies as our own analysis indicated uh, there was a need for. So uh, certainly better information systems um, that enable us to predict and mitigate the onset of, of famines are a, an incredibly important part of humanitarian action. Um, but information is constrained, particularly in the most difficult, the most sort of, if you will, uh, wicked problems that we face in this area. And it's also clear that information alone is not enough to trigger a response. Um, predicting famines or food security crises of a, of a lesser um, severity must include tracking climatic and environmental factors. It must continue to include tracking market and production factors, etc. But we've also got to come to better grips with the political factors that drive these, these crises. That includes better understanding of conflict, better conflict analysis, um, but it also includes somehow indicators of what is, might be likely to lead to what I just referred to as response failure. Um, access and, and the, to affected populations and the ability to, to gather and analyze good quality information are likely to continue to be major constraints uh, to both um, analysis and declaration and therefore to good information, good or early warning. Um, and better assessment methods are certainly needed in, in um, severely constricted context in order to be able to make clear and unambiguous um, determinations, which we have 
unfortunately not been able to do in recent times, but also the means to ensure the independence and the rigor of the analysis and any subsequent declarations um, has to be built into the kinds of processes that we develop. Um, it's, it's no longer enough to simply say we have rigorous methods and we have um, good indicators and we have, uh, therefore, a good understanding of what's going on. We've got to figure out ways that information and analysis systems can both work in local partnership, building local capacity, et cetera, but also in extremis um, ensure an independent and ad adequate and accurate um, <coughs> analysis and therefore um, declaration of status. And finally, we've got to find some kind of a more permanent solution to this problem of competing imperatives. In this case, the humanitarian imperative competing with a security or counterterrorism uh, imperative. I, th I think it's fairly clear that political or security imperatives are always going to outweigh um, humanitarian imperatives on its own terms. But it seems to me, uh, it, particularly looking back at Somalia, but also some of these other contexts, that there's no reason why these kind of post-declaration workarounds that, that were eventually implemented in Somalia and have eventually been implemented in other places um, can't be permanently on standby uh, and can be pulled off a shelf and implemented when we see these things happening, when we see the likelihood of a response failure beginning to develop, um, rather than having to be worked out separately and after the fact uh, on a case-by-case -case basis, which we've seen in the past. So uh, I, I guess in a nutshell, Roger Mark, uh, we, we certainly have made great uh, strides in, in uh, information collection, in, in the, the, the rigor of, of, of our processes, in, in, the, in the kind of analytical tools that we have, in being able to compare across different crises so that we're able to, to um, allocate resources more impartially than we have been in the past. And yet a number of constraints remain, and those constraints are largely political, they're not technical. So at some point, we've got to get down and dirty about the politics of information um, as, as we move forward. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Dan. I think um, a lot of, of, of really good uh, points on the challenges that we face when we bring uh, the political situation into context. So I hope we'll be able to talk a little bit more about that. Um, so, Richard, I, I wonder whether you're going to be talking about how we can get down and dirty into the politics of information. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Richard Chilotin is a senior associate focused on food security and climate change at Tetra Tech International Development Services. He's a former chief of the World Food Program's Climate and Disaster Risk Reduction Unit and uh, over his career has, has developed some well-recognized expertise in climate change adaption and uh, uh, risk mitigation, resilience, food security, emergency preparedness, and, and early warning. So Richard, um, Dan has, has said to us that information is not, not enough to trigger action, and I know that you have been working specifically on looking at innovations that will spur action, innovations that are helping to support the most vulnerable to become more resilient and improving systems so that the, um, there is some action taking place. I wonder you can tell us a little bit more about what you are seeing in terms of um, innovations that are emerging and to what degree we're making some progress. Thanks, uh, thanks, Roger Mark. I'm, I'm never sure if it's good to be the last one on a panel because <laughs> uh, your colleagues uh, can quite often uh, make all the points that you intend to make um, along the way. Um, I was thinking a, a lot, especially during Dan's, uh, Dan's discussion about the, the state of affairs um, and globally, especially in the sustainable development goals, uh, some hope for optimism over what was uh, achieved in the Millennium um, Development Goals that preceded them. Overall, hunger globally has, has gone down from, from over a billion people to 795 a billion people chronically undernourished now. Uh, conflicts have reduced uh, in the last few years from 63 in 2008 to, to 2014. Um, but underneath that optimistic um, progress we've made, 
um, some really worrying trends are, are going on. Um, humanitarian needs um, have gone up by almost five-fold uh, in the last 10 years, from $3.4 billion uh, globally in 2006 to $20 billion last year. And at the start of this year, global humanitarian needs are $22.5 billion, uh, estimated by, by OCHA, with 128 million people in need of humanitarian assistance this year, 70 million. Uh, in need of food assistance, as, as Dan mentioned, that Fuse, uh, FuseNet put out um, yesterday. Um, at the same time, uh, conflicts have become more intense. Um, those 63 conflicts in 2008 were responsible for an estimated 56,000 uh, fatalities in 2014. That was 180,000. So less conflicts, but much more intense and much more protracted humanitarian crises. The average period of displacement is now 17 years uh, in, in the world. Um, you know, I think um, everyone's mentioned innovation on, on the panel, and, and, and those, uh, those statistics I just give you, I think, um, provide a really strong um, rationale for why there's so much innovation at the moment. Um, amongst uh, you know, all of us working on long-term food security and on, on humanitarian response to, uh, to crises around the world because we have no choice. As, as Dan said, there was a 50% gap in humanitarian funding last year. L last year, there was more humanitarian funding than there has ever been before, more than ever, but there's never been a bigger gap in humanitarian funding. Um, and 2017 looks like it's going to be uh, even, even worse. So we're all innovating out of, of necessity. Um, and there's lots of interesting things going on. So, so first, maybe I'll just touch on kind of three uh, concrete areas where, where we're seeing innovation. But then I'd also like to make a point about innovation in, in general to, to conclude. Um, first, Dan said you know, quite quite clearly that uh, even though we had good early warning for Somalia, there was a failure of, of, of response. Um, and that's not the only case. There's been a huge improvement in the quality of early warning over the last 10 or 15 years. Uh, most major food crises especially have been predicted with six uh, or more months of, of notice uh, since then. Uh, yet in most cases, uh, there hasn't been an adequate early response. We get an early warning, we wait for an agricultural season to fail, we, we assess the situation, we do the same kind of things that we, um, we did before. Um, and that's caused a number um, of us to realize that what we need is much more predictability of response and predictability of funding for response. Um, and to be able to uh, establish systems that are um, going to respond almost without human uh, intervention. In other words, we decide we're going to respond beforehand, and then if something happens, we do it uh, instead of discussing it. Um, and there's a lot of work going on around trying to turn that early warning, early action um, idea into, into practice. Um, so the first kind of innovation area that I want to touch on is in, in risk financing. There's a tremendous amount of uh, work and some really good examples um, of institutions and countries putting in place um, mechanisms to ensure that money is on the table when it's uh, needed. For example, in Ethiopia, um, for their productive safety net, there's a risk financing mechanism which includes both a contingency budget and a $250 million contingent finance fund, uh, which is triggered based on uh, agroclimatic early warning data. The African Union has established the African Risk Capacity, which is a index-based drought insurance mechanism where countries can pay insurance premiums to cover them against drought. Um, and that's uh, now operating in seven countries and has paid out in, in a number of them uh, right at the end of the agricultural season based on uh, agroclimatic drought um, triggers. Uh, 
Humanitarian agencies are going further and using climate forecasts to trigger financing um, before a potential disaster um, strikes using something called forecast-based financing. The Red Cross, the START Network, which is a network of UK NGOs and the World Food Programme are all putting in place this kind of, of mechanism. Um, one of the interesting things about forecast-based financing is um, forecasts uh, are not always right. Uh, in other words, uh, our climate friends will tell us there's a 60% chance of a drought occurring in a place. That means there's a 40% chance the drought won't occur. Um, and so if you decide to take action at that point, uh, there's a chance that your action might be in vain, that nothing might happen and you didn't need to, to respond. Um, although given that um, 80 percent of the world's food insecure people live in highly degraded environments um, and rely on rain-fed uh, agriculture for their livelihoods. Even a small climate shock can quickly translate into a disaster. But um, there's an increasing willingness among the humanitarian community to take the risk of, of, of taking action before something happens to reduce its potential impact, um, even, if they, even if they get it wrong. Um, and there's some strong economics behind that. Uh, DFID did a study called the uh, Economics of Early Response and Resilience, where they calculated that if uh, we had responded immediately after droughts in Kenya over the last 20 years, instead of waiting six to nine months to trigger a response, which has been the typical situation in Kenya, we would have saved $20 billion, billion dollars a year, and we could have mounted four full-scale uh, emergency responses to drought uh, before we started losing money. Um, in other words, responding to drought when there wasn't one, it would have taken us four, four responses to start losing money. So we know that you can save enough money by anticipating um, a problem to justify acting in vain uh, at times. And that, that's pretty exciting because um, that means um, that um, you can help farmers switch from uh, their normal seed varieties to drought tolerant varieties or improve on farm drought management practices. Uh, or you can trigger blanket supplementary feeding programs for kids in an area that traditionally face high rates of acute malnutrition during drought before the drought occurs so that they can be in better uh, health and nutritional status to deal with that stress when it comes. Um, ultimately uh, helping them weather the, the shock, but also uh, saving significant costs later on down the road because the kinds of things that you would need to do if you didn't take that preventative action are often much more, much more expensive. So there's a lot of really exciting work going on in, in risk financing to try and get ahead of that curve and be more, more predictable. Um, the second area is you know, we, s we see often the most visible um, crises, but those, those, those crises are happening in places that uh, have recurrent uh, lower level um, food crises and, and, and stress, and, and we only see them uh, when they become acute, when there's a particularly, um, particularly difficult shock and that that's something that's been recognized for a long time and there's been a huge investment particularly in, in Africa and, and Asia in improving the, the scope and quality of social protection systems um, that provide transfers um, to the most vulnerable but also are used to do things like large-scale landscape transformation um, and Alan touched on a number of really important points, particularly trying to um, layer different kinds of interventions to get a better, more complex um, problem solved. And you're seeing a lot of innovation around social protection systems where on a large scale, governments and development <laughs> organizations are trying to build in um, both work to reduce the level of risk through things like large-scale watershed management or soil and water conservation, um, or for example, uh, better marine ecosystem conservation um, with those people, um, but then also bringing in value chains and markets and insurance and, and other things. And the, 
Um, those things are, are often complicated and difficult to do, but the impact evaluation results that we see are, are really promising. For example, um, in um, a program implemented um, by the World Food Program and Oxfam called the R4 Rural Resilience Initiative, uh, they allow poor farmers working uh, on soil and water conservation as part of their country's safety net program to work extra days on uh, infrastructure that helps reduce uh, drought and flood risks in exchange for an insurance policy which pays them out during a drought and improves their access to microcredit. Um, after four or five years of doing this, the impact evaluations showed that uh, farmers who were participating in this more integrated program had 123% more savings, 254% more household cereal stocks, 25% more plow oxen. They invested 25% more in agricultural labor. Uh, and when there were droughts and payouts, they uh, kept their kids in school rather than pulling them out to work on their, on their farm. And they invested in better seeds um, and inputs uh, for their uh, crop the, the next year. In a totally different context in, in the Philippines, an integrated um, approach to building uh, local capacities in fisheries management, uh, local marine ecosystems um, management, and better uh, information sharing with local, um, local fisher folks improved incomes by 77%. So you're seeing significant development outcomes coming through the integration of resilience approaches and and social protection. The, the third area that, that I, I think is, is really important, and it speaks a bit to the context-specific uh, challenges that um, Alex and, and Ellen brought up, uh, is, um, and there's so much happening with the data revolution and, 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 and mobile, mobile technology, but getting um, the right information to people so they can make better risk management decisions themselves is, is, really, is really critical. Uh, there are clearly not enough resources to deal with the, um, all of the, the problems that we see, and, and only by really empowering people to, to manage their own risk uh, are we going to address um, all of these these problems? Uh, w one example, for example, uh, one example from from Ethiopia is, is Project Concern um, International and, and, and Google and, and the USA Development Lab have been developing a, um, a program called uh, SAPARM, which takes um, uh, pasture maps from satellite remote sensing that come from the Ethiopian government's national early warning system, um, and they map them on top of local grazing areas for pastoralists in pastoral areas of Ethiopia uh, and Tanzania. Um, those maps are then printed out for, for just the cost of the paper. The, the early warning system exists, that's being paid for and maintained and operated. Uh, the mapping process is a fairly straightforward thing. Uh, and then every 10 days, these maps get printed out and, and given to pastoralists who use them to make decisions about um, where they'll send scouts to check out the pasture conditions. If they have uh, cows and, and, and camels, they're a bit finicky about what they eat. So you got to make sure that the pasture is tasty for them. Uh, or if they have sheep and goats, they just send, they just send them. Uh, and in the first year of using those maps, uh, livestock mortality along trekking routes dropped by 40% for those pastoralists. It costs 17 times more to replace a cow in Ethiopia than it does to, to prevent it, it, its death. So um, simple things like getting you know, the right information to people so they can make uh, better decisions about how to manage the risks they face have a tremendous potential to really um, help in, in these circumstances. Um, I'll uh, stop there, uh, Roger Mark, and hopefully we can get into a good, great, good discussion. Thank you. That was excellent. Uh, hearing those really concrete examples and seeing those numbers on the power of um, intervening early and, and sort of what it means in terms of uh, developing integrated programming, I think, was, was really um, eye-opening for us. I'd, I'd like to open it up. I'd like to hear from you. Um, we'd like to see what questions you have. We have, uh, if you have any questions or comments, raise your hand and uh, my colleagues will come to you with a microphone and we'll ask you to um, up front, please. 
yes, if you could um, give your name and your affiliation and get quickly to your question or your comment, and we'll take a few at a time. Hi, thank you all um, for your wonderful um, comments today. Um, I'm Diana Cayley. I'm currently with Crown Agents. Um, I recently finished my doctoral dissertation on the measurement of urban food insecurity. Um, and wor I worked in Kampala, which is where Dan did his dissertation research too. <laughs> it's kind of a follow on on that. Um, and so my question is, how can we measure acute and chronic vulnerability among the urban poor? Like we were saying, getting that level of granularity um, is really different and with the more than doubling of the urban population between 2010 and 2050. I see a crucial need in my career um, to be able to do this. So I thought, if you have thoughts on that, that'd be great. Thank you. Great, thank you, yes. Any other questions or comments, yes? Ben, just, just right here, Benjamin? Right here, please. Uh, up front, where are you going? Okay, great, thanks. Hi, uh, Lori Timmerman, Livelihood Specialist. And so one of the things, um, working in the Congo and uh, getting to South, South Africa, um, a real missing gap in, ag in agriculture that I found was for appropriate technology, for small pieces of equipment, of mechanization, that is embedded at the level, like the um, design for the other 90% approach. And it's a different type of approach than a traditional um, NGO. You don't gift it, you embed it into the local economy, you, and it even uh, backs up to the uh, education system, the crucial need for vocational education for um, machine. <coughs> uh, so I'd like you know, this little machine shop at the Songhai Center to be replicated throughout Africa. Great, thank you. Yes, please. Hi, Becky Chaka from USAID. Um, all the presentations were very interesting. Ellen, I particularly appreciated you the your lessons learned uh, about um, how resilience is being incorporated in programming. Mm -hmm. And I was curious if you could say some more about what role climate information may play in improving the resilience of programming and perhaps mm -hmm give some examples of how that has been helpful and how the people involved in programming can access climate information that's the right information for them and understandable to them, as well as potentially the degree to which climate change information may not be needed for building resilience into programming. Thank you. I like the second part of that question. Very interesting. So we, let's, let's deal with these and then we'll come, come to you. Um, so, uh, Richard, when you were talking, I think one of the things that really struck me is you talk about these integrated approaches, and I think across the panel, and, and you talked about this, we talked about the ability of um, the humanitarian community to respond. You said there's a shortfall in funding. You said there, there may be an inclination in the, in the humanitarian community to um, invest in, in action, anticipatory action earlier. Um, one question that I wanted to raise from your perspective of the panel, to what degree is this a development issue or is this a humanitarian issue? And I appreciate that I am setting up a false dichotomy <laughs> purposefully. <laughs> So is this, is this a development issue or a humanitarian issue? How do we measure acute and chronic um, food insecurity in the urban poor? Um, what's the role of appropriate technology and how do we embed that in local systems, particularly thinking of education? Climate information, um, how do local populations access, use that information, how do they get the right information, and do they need to access that information to build uh, resilience? So who would like to start? Alex, let me start with you. Well, I'll one or any of the above. Well, I'll just take on your 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 rather um, provocative question and just say that I think we may be facing a situation, especially in 2017, where you know the ability to build resilience and plan for these long-term solutions is going to be constrained because we're throwing so much money at uh, essentially response, uh, humanitarian response. So. Um, you know, we all yearn for a world where, you know, the kinds of interventions that Ellen uh, described and, and Richard as well can be um, really prevent this, these tragedies from unfolding um, because they really aren't, in, in many ways, they're not climate crises, right? They're, 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 develop they're political crises at, at rock bottom. Um, and uh, so I, 
I think that while it may be a false dichotomy at some level, there is going to be real resource constraints in terms of how you deal with these things. Okay. Thank you. Ellen? Can I respond to several other questions? Sure, please, go for it. All right. Um, thank you so much for those questions. I guess on the question of urban food security, I think that was your question, thank you. Um, it's a tremendous challenge, and it's an area that USAID has identified for a priority for um, further technical innovation and analysis in the next phase of FuseNet, for example. Um, I think that one interesting area of work is understanding the, the geographic distribution of food insecurity and poverty in cities, in different types of cities, because different types of cities have very different distribution patterns according to income. We know that um, compared to villages, for example, uh, people tend to be more geographically clustered by uh, income levels. You know, it's the sort of na poorer neighborhoods, wealthier neighborhoods. It varies by city um, and by scale of city. But I think what you need in the beginning is a, s a sense of the layout of every major city, and maybe we can develop sort of um, typologies, you know, approaches to do that. And then on the basis of that, you can develop your sampling plan and actually set up a food insecurity monitoring system. Um, we do have livelihoods analyses, um, including food economy analyses and CFSVAs from WFP in urban areas. Um, and we do have nutrition surveillance in urban areas. What I haven't seen is a, a really effective synthesis of those different types of studies in uh, urban areas yet, although I think it's possible. Um, but it's certainly going to be resource intensive. Um, what urban food security analysis requires is a much better understanding of labor markets, especially informal labor <coughs> markets and informal food markets. Um, and I think that's an area that I that we'll work on much more um, in the coming few years as we prioritize urban food security assessment and monitoring going forward. Are, um, are you seeing any particular innovations in an urban context? Oh my gosh, especially in Southern Africa. Um, University of Cape Town, I think it is, does wonderful work on urban food security analysis and monitoring. Um, so that's, I would say, a, a center for uh, innovation. Fantastic. Thank when, you. So yeah, when, when is, is that? Um, the abstract will be in the spring. Okay, and you're okay. submitting? Yes. Very good. The Cornell, the Cornell last year. Okay. So it's, and it's in Cape Town this year? Okay. Wonderful. They do very good work. In fact, it, I think every country in the region is fantastic. So, yeah, and thank you. Sun, yes, exactly. Yeah, wonderful. That's AFSUN. Food Security Urban, sun, Urban Network, Network or something. Yeah. yeah. Very good. Um, the question about um, mechanization, I think that was yours, thank you. Um, one reason why, I, th I, I couldn't agree with you more, absolutely. I think that the um, increased allowance for non-food programming um, and the increased layering of, let's say, bringing in OFDA um, uh, funds and other types of funds allows uh, the dedication of resources to commercial products effectively for small and medium size enterprises and micro enterprises um, that I th that I think are also increasingly locally driven, as they say, you know, all sort of development solutions are local, start local. And there's a recognition in this kind of microfinancing uh, and private sector orientation that's really taken over the development community, I think appropriately for sustainability, um, that emphasizes uh, enabling the um, Hmm. This sustainable livelihoods of very poor households, but also the creation of wealth among kind of small and medium enterprises and linking them to larger scale enterprises. And so I think the appropriate technology piece is really important. And we're certainly seeing more emphasis on n never providing those materials, but in fact, um, training uh, local folks to create them if possible and ensure the availability of those products in the market so it's sustainable. And that's what I was referring to when I mentioned the system strength market system strengthening this um, this starting point becomes not provision of those technologies but the um, the identification of actors within the market system and finding ways to make it profitable for them to produce and use those things um, the other little piece at the risk of being verbose 
I apologize, okay. is literacy. I, I feel like I'm, we're starting to see a little bit of return to literacy. Um, and within that, it's not literacy for literacy's sake, but it's vocational training. So literacy programs in the DFAPs focusing on uh, market information, on um, maternal and child health and nutrition messaging. So you're linking it. It's like this wraparound kind of comprehensive approach where what they're learning in the literacy programs is uh, not only consistent, but very deliberately reinforcing the messaging and the market interventions and the um, maternal and child health interventions. So it, it comes under the heading, I think, of integrated programming, which is fabulous. So uh, voila. should I, since I'm blabbering on, should I mention um, something about the climate resilience info? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Was that your question? Okay. Um, one um, example of where I see this coming in, in is Uganda, where um, USAID funded some vulnerability analysis that was incorporating, you know, we have DHS and MIX and LSMS and these other major surveys that can be mined to get a great deal of information about spatial distribution of, of um, vulnerability to food insecurity and poverty, and, uh, and sometimes malnutrition if you're lucky and you have the data. And um, and what was and there was an activity in parallel. I think it's a great example because Dan, you were talking about you know famines and large scale food um, crises in this day and age are often in areas of acute conflict with non state armed actors. You know tremendously complex environments. And in Karamoja, uh, in northeast Uganda, um, the conflict is reducing. They're in tremendous social flux in, tr flux in terms of gender roles um, and in terms of uh, natural resource use. And um, there was a forced disarmament. You know, it just everything that could be in flux about livelihoods is and, and culturally. And it's, a, it's an environment that has a lot of potential for conflict. And um, the NGOs, USAID is funding this um, livestock pilot that focuses on uh, supporting livestock commercialization out of Karamoja, especially to markets throughout Uganda. And what they did is fascinating. They did a, um, I think it's just been wrapped up in the last few months, a natural resource mapping activity where they looked at where are all the, tri the ethnic groups? Um, are they re resuming their traditional um, pastoral patterns? Are they establishing new ones? How are they handling conflict at the water points? How are they handling um, the increasing emphasis on farming, you know, among folk who aren't traditional farmers, and um, and it's it gets into the cultural bits, you know, which is all, uh, you know, Dan talked about um, the ethnic issues around, um, I you know, the ethnic I guess differences and vulnerability and social connectedness in Somalia and the effects of conflict with Al Shabaab. You know, you need to co sort of understand the local conflict context, and so. What they did was um, they knew that there was climate change happening in this area. They knew that there was tremendous social flux in the use of natural resources. And so they're doing this tremendous multi-agency natural resource mapping activity. Um, but what I don't necessarily see yet is an overlapping of that with the climate change projections. You know, I think we're s still in a way, we're moving quickly on um, good livelihoods programming, but there's still room for improvement on integrating what's coming out of the scientific community about what's being projected. I know FuseNet has done, um, I think we have FuseNet in the house here, can clarify. We've They've done some climate change projections for a number of their countries. So I think it's in the media in the medium term, sort of five years out or so, um, looking at what areas are likely to get drier, et cetera. So there's just um, opportunities immediately available to kind of synthesize those levels of analyses. And I think they're starting to happen, but um, it's an area for development. Does that make, does that make sense? Yeah. Thank you. Dan? Uh, Mark, could you repeat what I think was intended to be a provocative comment about about uh, humanitarian or development? Uh, I didn't quite catch the, the question. So it, it, the issue that we're dealing with, do you see this as primarily a development issue or a humanitarian issue? Okay, and are we allowed to say both and? You can say what you <laughs> like. <laughs> I mean, uh, for, for uh, it, sort of in spite of myself, I've become a humanitarian over the course of my, my career. I didn't intend to to do that, uh, but I, I, I teach a number of classes on, on sort of humanitarian action and humanitarian analysis, and one of the toughest problems is trying to define what is humanitarian. 
because it spills over not only, I mean, you know, the humanitarian development divide is one we often talk about in, in a resilience context. Yeah. It spills over into, into democracy and governance, and governance kinds of issues. It spills over into security uh, and peace building kinds of issues, and it spills over into, you know, conflict resolution and, and um, you know, peace building generally kind of. Uh, so so I, don't, I don't find these uh, boundaries to be very helpful or, or very, uh, very well defined. I, th I think from a programmatic point of view, it, it's, in, it's incredibly important to build in the, the kinds of things, for example, that Richard was talking about with regard to um, uh, crisis modifiers or <coughs> what in the Horn of Africa is coming to be called no regrets programming. In other words, things that you can build into your programs that you, in, into long-term, you know, what we might call in this context development or resilience uh, programs, um, but which can be done to protect people's assets or protect people's uh, livelihoods or indeed even protect consumption or access to services in, in, in crisis or in extremis, but which, which have uh, beneficial impacts even if the, the predicted crisis doesn't, doesn't develop. Or, you know, budget lines that sit in, the, in a, in a long-term program until such a time as sort of mitigative actions are required, but then the, bu the, then the budget is there. You don't, have to, you don't have to write a new project proposal. You don't have to go to the, the whole um, sort of assessment appeal cycle of a sort of classical humanitarian action. So, I mean, t t to me, um, the, 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 the labeling I isn't, isn't terribly helpful. I think, I think a, a focus on problems rather than on who's, whose turf it is uh, is probably uh, a better way to go. Um, maybe just a few thoughts on, on Diana's question um, with regard to urban food security. I, I'm, I'm not sure that the measures necessarily are, are different. I mean, the, in detail they are, um, but, but at, at, a, at, a sort of a, at a sort of a broad level, I, th I think the measures of food insecurity are probably similar or similar enough that we can use similar looking things across both urban and rural um, Context. I think what's different is the the uh, the, the drivers of, of urban food insecurity, um, and I, I, I certainly agree. We need to understand labor markets better. I mean, urban livelihoods um, generally we, we need to understand better, and and urban systems as well. I mean, we we, we don't tend to think of things like um, you know waste management systems or or other things in in a rural context to put people at, at risk now maybe we should but i think we tend to think about those things and look at the impact of of uh demographic change and and especially rapid urbanization on on these kind of things um in urban areas and and lastly i think we need to look at at the risks differently um pe people in a in a monetized urban economy face a very different set of risks than people in um uh, a, a, a rural <coughs> context where they can d depend to some degree on on uh, subsistence production. Um, you know, d during during the famine in Somalia, um, it was very clear that, that one of the ways in which people survived was through their social networks, and to the extent that their social networks uh, included people in urban areas who were not affected by the drought and who were less affected by the conflict with Al-Shabaab and so forth, and they could draw on resources from those people. Um, or for that matter, people in the diaspora that face a totally different uh, set of risks, uh, those people were much better uh, placed to, to survive a, a crisis of the magnitude of that, of that famine. Uh, on the other hand, I had a graduate student uh, a few years ago who looked at the impact of the, of the food price crisis in 2008, 2000, well, 2007, 2008, I guess. Um, and uh, of course, his conclusion was that people who had access to uh, Subsistence means of production, or you know, home gardening, or whatever. We're much better able to to uh, withstand that shock. So, th the the extent to which people's risk profiles differ, and the extent to which their livelihoods incorporate enough diversity um, to deal with those risks, I I, th I think is the is the, is the big challenge, and I think we're better at doing that in, in rural areas just because we we're, we're more used to working there. Thank you, Richard. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, uh, Richard. Um, you need to let Richard go first next time. I know, I was thinking. <laughs> no, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Give me time to, to think. That's, that's okay. Um, yeah, well, you, s you said it, false dichotomy for development uh, versus uh, humanitarian. Um, I, unlike Dan, went, went the opposite way. I'm an emergency manager by, by training, 
uh, and now I find myself a lot of the time working on adaptation, social protection, and resilience in a much longer term sense. <coughs> um, when uh, when I worked at uh, the World Food Program, which is primarily seen as a development organization, we wanted to know. Uh, sorry, primarily seen as a humanitarian organization. Um, we wanted to know, um, used, used to be 25 years ago, development organization. Um, we wanted to know where, um, where we were responding to, to climate disasters, and we wanted to know where we were doing disaster risk reduction uh, and climate change uh, programming because we felt like these were new areas of longer term programming for the organization. Um, and so we, we looked at all the projects over the, the last 10 years and we found some really interesting things. We found that um, half of the projects that WFP had done over the last 10 years had been in response to climate disasters. And we had spent $23 billion responding to them. What was interesting is that in 20 countries we had had five or more emergency or uh, post-disaster recovery operations over those 10 years. So in other words, in 20 countries, at least every other year, an emergency response or, or recovery. In, in one country, 11 uh, emergency response and recovery operations over, over 10 years. So is that a humanitarian or a development project where you essentially are every other year responding to a, a climate disaster? 75% of the disaster risk reduction work that the organization did, which was in 50% of its projects and 75% of the countries, were in emergency and recovery operations. Um, and so I, I, I think, you know, we, we have been hobbled in a way by this, this dichotomy because we're doing a tremendous amount of work helping people prepare for, respond to, and recover from disasters. And we're putting false limits on the kind of programming that we do, especially in post-disaster recovery. Um, and instead of focusing on doing quality work that will help people build long-term resilience and disi reduce disaster risk, especially in recovery contexts, uh, we're, we're over the long run having to spend much more money uh, dealing with the symptoms of that lack of action. So it's a long-term development problem, but d you can't do development anymore without assuming that along the way disasters and crises will come uh, and at the very least erode the gains that you're, um, that you're making. And I, I think in some ways that's, um, that's happening. The whole resilience conversation when it started, I think for many of us, was very exciting because it gave us a way to talk about how we should be programming in these contexts instead of trying to fit it into the, the buckets that we, um, that we have. Um, the, the question on, on climate, um, I could go on on that issue, so I'll stop myself there. It seems like a nice point. Uh, the question on climate information, uh, I think, is, is also an interesting one. I, I, I found two things. First, there's a lot of very technical climate analysis of climate variables, which tells us things about the climate. And it doesn't tell us very much about people and their livelihoods or their environment and how the climate interacts with them um, and how that then affects their their lives. Um, and we need to do a lot more work to answer specific development questions with climate information rather than trying to decipher um, particularly climate change projections, which are not always, always useful. And when you can, when you can do that, um, you learn very interesting things. Um, I think you need to understand what the past climate has been, uh, what the trends have been, and what the current climate is before you even start to talk about where the climate is going and how that relates to, um, to people. M I think most of the people that, that we all try to, to, to help don't have the capacity to manage the current levels of climate risk that they, that they face. Um, 
Uh, that's likely to get worse under, under climate change, but without understanding where we are now and how that works, you can't really say much about what's going to happen when the temperature goes up by 1.5, 2, 4, 6 degrees. Um, and you, you learn some interesting things when you try to jam those things together, food security data and, 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 and climate data in a, in a more meaningful full way. So, for, for example, one, one study um, that I was involved in took the uh, food security data for Mali and disaggregated um, people's sources of food and income and expenditure by their sensitivity to climate zone by livelihood uh, and uh, by wealth group to determine where in the country people were more or less sensitive to climate risk and which climate risks. And then we used that data to put in context the climate uh, data that we had. Um, and there were some really interesting conclusions, things like it doesn't really matter if it rains above you if all of your water comes down a river um, that's fed by rain from somewhere else. So stop looking at the climate right up there all the time and start looking over, over here, like the Guinea Highlands for the Niger Delta in Mali, for example. Another thing we found is that the most uh, food insecure people in the center of Mali, so between the uh, nomadic pastoral north uh, uh, and the more productive south, were the least diversified. They relied almost entirely on livestock and rain-fed crop production, millet and sorghum primarily. But after the climate shift of the 1970s, which is the largest recorded shift in climate on, on, on record, uh, that part of uh, Mali and the Sahel in, in general went from having enough rain to sustain a millet and sorghum harvest two out of three years to having enough rain to sustain a millet and sorghum harvest one out of three years. And the people who were better off uh, could afford to diversify. So in that, uh, those parts of Mali, the, the better off, more food insecure people had at least two non-climate sensitive sources of food and income. Um, and so what, we, what we, we found was a group of people who were too poor to adapt to their climate change from the 1970s and, 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 and 80s and who were essentially trapped in a, in a non-productive climate and unable to, to adapt. So that, ki that kind of information is incredibly useful because now you know uh, specifics about uh, a group of people and, and, and the dynamic of how the climate is affecting their livelihood and, and also what's made the difference for the people who have been able to, to improve their, their livelihoods and, and, and well-being. So I think we need much, m much more of that, taking the climate information and analyzing it through the, the lens of the questions that we have in the food security sector or water sector or, or, or other sectors in, in order to answer those kind of, kind of questions. Great. Thank you. I think we had a question at the back. Um, so we take just three more. Quick questions, please. Yes. Sure. Uh, Ryan Crow from OSC. Um, beyond building in um, some automaticity to try to work around response failure, what can the um, development slash humanitarian community um, most productively do um, to address uh, response failure? Is it more research? Is it better mm -hmm. decision support? Is it something else? Are there, are there ways to sort of tackle the problem more directly? Great, thank you, yes. Yes, quickly, yes. Hello, okay. David Kalk with Food for Peace. Um, I have a question about social capital. I don't think anybody has mentioned it yet. Um, and social capital in the 21st century. So with migration flows and phones, we have remittance flows that are really quite substantial. Um, and there are quite a number of small countries, quite diverse actually, Philippines, Nepal, Guatemala, Somalia, where remittance flows are amongst the largest flows into, into those national economies. So any thoughts on opportunities to leverage those flows for, hu for, for uh, resilience and, uh, and response? Great, thank you. Yes, please. I'm Carlos Rodriguez with the United Nations Information Center. I had a question about the uh, role of the private sector in helping to implement some of the uh, food security uh, 
goals for the 2030 agenda that the UN is trying to implement with the SDGs? Great, thank you. And, and very quickly, please. Hi, my name is Russ Webster. First of all, thanks for a great presentation. I actually wanted to ask a question about the role of government. Um, and of course, in these situations, there are, there are many important actors. In a, in a highly fragile state setting, I don't think my question may be as relevant. But if we look at some other countries where there is some structure to government, both at the central and at the local level, I'm just curious to know what sorts of investments uh, do they need to be making perhaps both on the resilience preparation side, but also just in the general economic side. And are there some countries that you think are really looking uh, in a kind of a best practices way at what they need to be doing to help build um, resilient communities? And what are some lessons that we can learn from that in terms of the work that we're doing with other governments? Thank Great. you. Great, thank you very much. So I, I wanted to put two, and unfortunately we have a reception afterwards, uh, so we can continue the conversation during the reception. There are a couple other issues that I wanted to put out there. Um, you know, I've had this discussion with a number of practitioners on the front lines on these issues, and I've had diplomats come to me and say, Roger Mark, we need more diplomatic tools. We need help in developing diplomatic responses. So I just want to put that out there. We've been talking about this in terms of humanitarian development. What's the role of diplomacy and diplomats in engaging and, and addressing these issues? Very often they're on the front lines and trying to figure this out. And I also think that, Dan, um, in your comments earlier, you talked about the politics behind addressing these issues overseas in the local context. And um, currently in our country, the, we are facing some political shifts. So how, how do we keep programming focused on these priorities in the face of changing political environments? So I, I, I'm not anticipating that we have time to answer all of these questions right now. I hope that we will uh, touch on some of them as we go into the reception and we network informally. But Richard, I'm going to start with you this time. But you get to answer one. So choose which question you'd like to answer the most in about 30 seconds to give a comprehensive response. <laughs> Okay, 30 seconds to give a comprehensive response and one answer, and that was five seconds. So, <laughs> uh, I'll go with the first, the first question, uh, how do we address the response, um, the response failure? Mm -hmm. You know, I think um, in order for there to be an adequate level of um, response to um, different kinds of, of shocks and, and crises and, and to manage risk better, um, requires a, a really uh, robust system in every community, local district, state, province, country, and, and, and region. We've got to have more layers of, of risk management that's focused on making sure people at all of those levels understand what risks that they face, uh, how they can reduce them, and they have the systems in place to respond to them in an effective way when when, when that comes. That, that, that's the problem, I, I think. Many of the places where we've significantly improved the quality of the information analysis and especially early warning, the reason that responses haven't uh, happened, um, even when there is political will, is because the systems don't exist to translate that information into to action. And if you look at places like Ethiopia, the difference between 2003 uh, before the establishment of the productive safety net uh, and now is, is tremendous. The problem's grown in a sense because of many other factors but at least there's a, there's a basic system in place to deal with the chronic uh, problems of food insecurity that can scale up to a certain point as there's uh, stress on the system and beyond that there's an emergency management system uh, with another level of capacity. And when, when, you, when you have that kind of investment in systems, and especially national systems, this comes a bit to the role of government question as, as well, um, then the information can drive a response. If you don't have the response systems, it doesn't matter if you have the information. All you'll know is that the house is burning down and you won't have a fire truck or a hose. Okay. Thank you. Dan? Uh, 
Let me say something else about the response failure question because I sort of I sort of posed it, um, and it maybe gets a little bit at your issue also about um, the role of of, um, of, of diplomacy and, and politics and so forth. I, I certainly agree with everything Richard said. Uh, the, the 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 problem that I was trying to highlight is a rather different one, and, and that is the um, the the politics that lead to the, f the the failure of response to what we know are uh, acute happening right now or happening very soon uh, crises. These almost always boil down to, to, to some kind of a political issue. There are, technical, there, there are technical means of addressing these, but they almost always boil down to, to um, some kind of a, a, of a political issue. I'm not sure I would go so far as to say this, but my colleague Alex Duvall has just, has just written a book on famine, and, and he categorically says that there, there is no famine without uh, a, a, a political cause. In the, in the kinds of contexts that I was describing, the places where we face the risk, now I'm not talking about you know, chronic food insecurity um, or, even, or, or even crises of a, of, of a relatively uh, modest magnitude. I'm talking about actual famines. I'm talking about places where you know, the, 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 the prevalence of kids under five who are malnourished is greater than 30 percent, that where there's you know, more than two people per 10,000 per day dying and 20 percent of the population actually having no access to food. That, that's, sort of our, that's, that's sort of our technical threshold for what constitutes a famine. In, in, in those places, um, I, the, 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 the response failure is, is almost always some kind of political issue. In Somalia, it was a combination of an armed non-state group labeled as a foreign terrorist organization that restricted access. Uh, by b both local and international humanitarian actors. It was a complete absence of, of a state with any responsibility for its, for its population. Um, and it was international policies that, that um, was more worried about humanitarian assistance ending up in the hands of, of, uh, of a terrorist organization than it was about people dying from famine until the famine was declared. So how do we, uh, and, and that was the response failure. So how do we, how do we, um, take lessons from, from a situation like that and, and, and think ahead. Well, I mean, t to me, one of the things is we eventually, you know, there are people in this town who worked hard to, to um, identify and address that constraint and that issue. And over the course of six or seven months, some, some, some workarounds were, were developed. Uh, an OFAC license was put in place. Uh, some of the other, some of the other uh, constraints were, were relaxed or suspended uh, temporarily. There's no reason why we couldn't do those things on, on, on a, we, we couldn't have a standby mechanism to do those kinds of things. But on the other hand, one of the problems in this business is we're always fighting yesterday's battles. Uh, so, you know, what happened in Somalia in 2011 isn't quite the same thing that happened in, in, in Nigeria in 2016, even though there were some similarities in the context. One of the things that we worry about a lot, and this is probably where we get back to some kind of a divide between what's what's humanitarian and what's something else has to do with, with the nature of humanitarian action itself and particularly the principles on which humanitarian action is based. And one of these has to do with, with sort of independence and impartiality and, and neutrality. And everybody gets up in arms when you say these things. But if, if you look over time, the, the organizations that go out of their way to operate that way have much better access, their staff is, is less insecure in the field, and they are able to reach um, affected populations. Now, not always. Um, they weren't able to in, in, in Boko Haram controlled territories. They certainly aren't in ISIS controlled territories. But to some degree, they have been able to do that in Taliban controlled territories, in Al Shabaab controlled territories, et cetera. So, understanding the role of, if I may, humanitarian diplomacy, or what's different about protecting people's lives and livelihoods in extremis as opposed to in sort of, uh, you know, other kinds of, of circumstances, I think, remains a critical uh, issue. Um, and if I may, for just two seconds, respond to David's question. Um, I, I sort of edited that out of my remarks because of because of time constraints, uh, and because it's it's a rather different kettle of fish. But one of the things that we were interested in in Somalia, given the um, Given the, the, the delayed response and, and a response that was never able to reach into the sort of Al-Shabaab heartland, uh, our question was, so what happened there? Uh, we, we, we know that that was the epicenter of the, of the mortality, and, there, and you know, we lost a quarter of a million uh, lives, uh, our best estimate, in, in that famine. Uh, 
Um, but obviously millions of people survived, and what, what were the mechanisms? And, you know, if, if you're familiar with the, the literature on, on vulnerability and coping, you probably wouldn't be terribly surprised by the, the kinds of findings that, that interviews with, with, with two or three hundred uh, households that experienced that famine turned up. But what really stands out is, is in, in the Somalia case, is the extent to which people were able to mobilize resources to, for, for sort of self-help activities through their own social networks. So, th you know, uh, local community networks, commu uh, networks that maybe involved a local um, private sector or business community, um, especially people's networks if they involved um, people living in urban areas and having different access to resources and different, different risks. Uh, and of course, Somalia is, is, is famous for its global uh, diaspora. So to, to the extent that people's social networks could mobilize resources through those kinds of connections, uh, they were better able to, to, to uh, survive that kind of a crisis. And therefore, it's not, and, and of course in Somalia, most of this is organized along lineage or kinship or clan uh, lines. And it's not surprising that this, the stronger, the better educated, and the, and the more diversified clans were the ones who fared the best. The, 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 the clans that were less uh, diversified had fewer people in the diaspora, or indeed groups that fell completely outside the clan system, like the, like the so-called Somali Bantu, um, did not fare very well, and that they were the ones that suffered uh, the greatest uh, mortality. At the same time, though, I mean, so, so you, 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 you on, on the one hand, you kind of get this cheery picture of, of social cohesion and social um, capital through clan or, or kinship networks, but at the same time, th those same networks had a very negative effect because the more the the the, the, the stronger groups were were quite happy to exploit their positions of strength. They were quite happy to use the, the weaker clans as human bait to attract aid, which they then looted and sent to their own people or sold on the open market. So there is, there is both a kind of a, a, a cheerful, um, upbeat story to, to the, the, the mechanisms of social capital in, in these kinds of events and, and a very devastating um, manipulation of people's vulnerability and weaknesses in these kinds of situations. So um, I don't quite know where that leaves us with regard to, <laughs> to, um, to social capital, but, but certainly in a lot of these crises, uh, the extent to which people can mobilize their own resources is a huge factor in, in, in how well they do and how well they survive. Um, it's, it's difficult to make a global estimate about that, but, but um, some estimates are as high as, as uh, half to two-thirds of the sum total of assistance that people receive in crises comes not from the state or from the international humanitarian um, mechanisms, but, but through people's own uh, social networks. Thank you. Ellen? Um, building on that question of social capital, David, um, I think that's one of the major advantages of the emphasis on microfinance um, programming is that it effectively builds social capital for those who don't have it within the community because we know that community or traditional safety nets are in many cases more important than um, or at least equally important to international assistance to the survival of individuals in, in food shocks. And um, we certainly want to support those rather than undermine them. Um, and. I, and we're finding that um, the level of social capital that people have in uh, DFAP areas, for example, if there's microfinance programming or other, that's, that's the most common kind of, uh, other than mat um, mother care groups or something like that for MCHN interventions, um, people get grouped together for um, small scale kind of financial and income generating activities. And it builds social capital that then provides them connections when they need help with childcare or need help with uh, information, um, early warning information or whatever they need that it has this kind of broader um, multiplica m multiplicative effect um, throughout their lives. Um, and in fact, the data coming out of Prime in Ethiopia um, underscores the importance of social capital access as a determinant of, of food security status in case of shock. Um, a quick comment on um, the role of the private sector clearly is um, you know, the starting point of, for those who are working in the community level, the kind of programs I talked about, 
the starting point now is value chain analyses, you know, identifying the market actors, what their interests are, what their capacities are, what their the gaps are, um, what their level of connectedness is at different points in each value chain. And in fact, I think this layering of resources with other kind of, um, for example, feed the future resources, it allows you to work with large scale, you know, aggregators and those working in storage and large scale marketing and processing and all of that with the more downstream um, small and medium um, size enterprises and producers, you know, al allows a much higher, um, allows a, um, a much more sustainable role for the private sector, in fact, to uh, smooth um, local food availability in these markets where traditionally at the time of um, harvest, you know, all the food goes, goes out to the cities or to serve other markets. And so it's allowing for um, market level response to uh, effectively this um, massive outflow of food at harvest. And that leads me back to the point about working with government. There was a question of governance. And, you know, I, I'm not talking about the kinds of situations that um, Dan was talking about where there's such a massive, you know, there may be a massive government governance um, failure, I suppose we might say. But in cases where it's low capacity but it's still functional, um, we, I think, need to work on broad governance um, Strengthening interventions, and often I think engaging with the DNG staff within the mission can be key on that. Um, development planning, you know, working with uh, say regional and district um, partners on development planning. There, in some communities, you'll even find community development plans that were developed locally in a very participatory fashion. Um, contingency planning, where districts especially are developing contingency plans using their own funds, their own mechanisms. Um, land and resource management, absolutely essential, especially land tenure for women, is something that, that governments often need a great deal of support on. Um, and then the final um, kind of intervention point there related to governance is changing the mindset of our government partners. There is an expectation sometimes with our government partners that there will be a food aid intervention if there's a large scale crisis. And we're, you know, I was seeing in Uganda, for example, that the NGOs were ready to support market level interventions. And the government was habituated to external food assistance. And so um, there was some sensitization happening to kind of bring them around to um, working with traders um, and looking at storage facilities and price incentives and you know to have an effective market level intervention. Thank you. All right, I'm cognizant we're already over time. So just in response to uh, Ra's question about uh, governments uh, and uh, the, the um, I don't know if they're role models, but I do know that uh, Ethiopia has done a lot with the social protection programs, and um, they're facing their own food security crisis right now, so we'll see how well some of those programs actually perform. And uh, the World Bank has also been working in a lot of dryland countries uh, in, in the Sahel to, uh, to you know, develop better social pr protection mechanisms. Um, getting to David's question about uh, remittances, I actually did my master's thesis 30 years ago on remittances and the role <laughs> in the Senegal River Valley, and uh, so my information is really up to date. And <laughs> <laughs> um, that's where I was a Peace Corps volunteer in, in agriculture back, back in the day. Um, but, um, you know, the paper I mentioned earlier uh, that I thought was particularly innovative in its use of the demographic and health survey and mixed data, I think they controlled for a huge number of household variables to look at food insecurity issues and came up with basically the degree of connectedness to of the household through social networks as being one of the really critical variables uh, in a predictive variable in terms of uh, food security outcomes. So we know that these are really critical and one of my, my concerns is that in a world with increasing displacement and mm -hmm. migration and resettlement issues going on is how do you preserve those social networks and not have sort of an atomization of society. So I'll leave things on that somewhat pessimistic note. <laughs> Thank you, Alex. So
Um, so as, as we wrap up and move into our reception, you know, particularly with this discussion today, we wanted to have a sense of what's the state of play. Where do things stand? What do we know? How much progress we've made? I think we started the discussion by looking at drivers. We wanted to get a sense of what were some of the early warning systems and data that's being used to inform early warning and what it means in terms of thinking of long-term anticipatory measures that we could, could address. So we had a discussion around that. But we also talked about how we can bring together the climate um, data and information in the social context and what does that mean in terms of looking at vulnerability to food security issues. That, that um, enabled us to have a discussion around uh, current trends and what we're learning now. You know, we talked about we're seeing more protracted crises, that there are fewer conflicts, but they're more intense. There's a gap in humanitarian funding. So even though we may making progress and early warning, this is part of the context in which we're operating, which makes it really difficult for us to determine um, what, what can be done. At the same time, we discussed a lot of innovations that are occurring. We talked about innovations in management approaches, which were quite interesting. We talked about the co-location of approaches that is catalyzing impact. So what does that mean in terms of how we think of moving across sectors and um, integrating in a very practical way. And we talked about um, a lot of discussion around resilience from diversification of livelihood options and, and different ways to build resilience and how do we measure and, and build on that. So there was a really good framing in terms of where we are, how much we've learned, the progress we're making. But it, it led to a discussion on some of the frustrations. The crisis was well predicted. Very interesting. We have early warning but late response. So we talked a lot about the number of challenges that we are facing. How do we deal with this at a local level? How do we scale up monitoring? How do we look at the age, gender, livelihood, group, youth, differential factors for early warning? How do we get it down to a level of, of granularity at the very local level? How do we avoid black backsliding into poverty? How do we um, deal with questions around conflict and political dynamics? Poor data, missing data, um, gaps in funding. So um, recognizing the complexity and the challenges that, that we were facing. But it led us, I think, on the panel to talk about solutions. What, what can we do? How can we move more to the predictability of response? What can be done at the local level? How can we benefit and scale up what we're learning on risk financing? How do we work towards reducing the level of risk? How do we capitalize on these practical integrated approaches that we talked about? How can we continue to push forward this no regrets responses that we, we, we see very much evident in the humanitarian sector and, and recognizing that there's a continuum of responses that's leading from development to, to the humanitarian sector but also brings in um, diplomacy and the diplomatic core. What does it mean to empower people to deal with their own risks? Um, and how do we look at risks differently? And what does that mean in terms of our responses? Wow. <laughs> you covered a lot. I think that was an amazing discussion. Let's thank the panel. So once again, this has been video recorded. It will be video archived. We will write a summary of the discussion for you so you can find that with the recording of the event. That will be on our blog platform, newsecuritybeat.org. And we, I know we have lots more questions, so we have um, a time for reception now. My colleagues will direct you just across the hallway, and we're looking forward to continuing the dialogue. So thank you very much, and please stay for the reception. Thank you, Roger. That was excellent. Very good. <laughs> nice summary. <laughs> I, I was I was trying to count them, but I thought you had to.